Uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, man. Hey, give it up to Pastor Danny. What's up, guys? Go ahead and give yourself a round of applause because you made it to church this evening. You could be anywhere in the world right now, but you decided to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, and you said, okay, I might as well just go to church. I got nothing else to do. I might as well go to church. No, I'm totally kidding. Hey, for those who don't know me, my name is Danny. I'm honored to be a pastor here at Hope Chapel. Happy New Year. Um, I'm really excited about what God's going to be doing in your life this year. I'm really excited what he's going to be doing in you and through you, through your family. And um, I always believe that I always like to start my, my New Year's with just gratitude. Just, God, thank you that you're allowing me to enter into a new year. Thank you that you allowed uh, my family, my mom and dad, they're still here with me. Thank you that you're allowing us to be here another year. And I pray that that's our heart tonight, is that regardless of what you went through last year, you probably had to go through some, probably had to go to some funerals. You probably didn't think you had to attend. You probably had to do some hospital visitations that you probably hoped you never would anticipate in your life. But nonetheless, aren't you grateful that you are here in another year with God doing something in your life? If you're grateful, put your hands together and say, thank you, Jesus. For the next 20 to 25 minutes, we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture. The reason why we do that every single week here at Hope Chapel is is because we find it so important for us to be edified the Word of God. We believe that there is a devil out there. We believe that there are, there are he has uh, methods and, and strategies, and he's doing everything he can to trip us up. And so it is important for us to be able to get some sound doctrine in us, for us to be able to encourage, to be edified, to be exhorted, to whatever the case is um, on a weekly basis. And so we're going to be looking at a familiar portion of Scripture. So I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of John, and we're going to be in verse uh, chapter 12, John chapter 12. And we're going to be reading verses 1 down to verse 8. Verse 1 down to verse 8. John chapter 12. When you're there, say, I am there. If you're not there, say, I need more time. Take your time. Take your time. We're here till midnight. For those who do not have a Bible, then we're going to go ahead and display the words on the screen for you. So, therefore, we can all be on the same page. I'm going to be reading out the ESV version. Your version might be slightly different than mine, but we all believe that it's God's word at the end of the day. Amen? John chapter 12. John is the fourth book of the New Testament. I'm on page 2047. So you might be on a different page, but we're all on the same page if you know what I mean. My Bible titles this portion of scripture, Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. We read the gospel in the name of the Father, Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Hey, I may drop out, but you continue along. All right? One person's with me. Verse 1. Verse 1 says it like this. Six days before the Passover. That's important. The Passover. If you're taking down notes, we believe we're, take, we're a note-taking church. You want to highlight or underline Passover. It's the reason why it's capitalized. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. Everybody say Bethany. Bethany. Where, Lazarus was, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. I'm not sure why it doesn't say at the table, but you guys know what it means. Verse 3. Mary therefore, therefore took a pound of expensive anointment, ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but ointment, I'm sorry, verse 4, but J- Judas, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, Lord help us, Lord help us, Lord help us. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep, leave her alone so that she may keep it. For the day of my burial, verse 8, for the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always 
have me. Let us read verse, let us read verse 8 again. In concert, that means together, verse 8 says, For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And obviously he meant physically. My objective for by the end of this sermon is for us to be able to have a response of gratitude towards God as we enter in this new year. Look at your neighbor. Tell them the title of the sermon. The title of the sermon is, is a reciprocal response. If you don't have a neighbor, just tell yourself the title of the message, which is a reciprocal response. As we get ready to go into this, this sermon, um, before we pray, now that you know the objective, um, this Friday, I was just notified this evening that this Friday, our Supreme Court is going to be making a decision as to whether people uh, should be vaccinated or not. And so I think our prayer should be is whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, um, that people should have a choice. Um, if you're vaccinated, we want to let you know that we love you. If you're not vaccinated, we want to let you know that we love you. And if you got one shot instead of two and you're considered half sinated, <laughs> then we love you too. And it is important that it doesn't divide us as brothers and sisters of Christ. I'm reminded of that scripture when Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua made a conscious decision. He drew a line in the sand. He said, this is what we will do. And so I, I, I'm going to lead us in prayer that whatever they decide, that we should have a choice as citizens of the United States. Won't you pray with me? God, we thank you this evening, God, for allowing us to wake up another day of life. Thank you for the air in our lungs, Father. Thank you for the clothes on our back, the shoes on our feet, the money in our pocket, the food on the table, God. Thank you for our relationships. God, as we are here, God, we pray that your word will come forth with clarity, with power, and authority. As we get ready to journey into a new year church, uh, with our church, Jesus, we, we know, God, anything else outside of your will is just sinking sand. And we ask you, God Almighty, that you will speak to us in a profound, to, in a pro, profound way tonight, God. We pray for the people in the Supreme Court, God, the judges, and anybody who's going to be involved in this decision-making process. We pray, God Almighty, that your will will be done. And whatever's on the outside and the result of this decision, let us trust in your word, God. And let us not be afraid to be like Daniel and, 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 and when he was in a fiery furnace and Daniel and his three friends that drew a line in the sand and said, we won't bow down, Father, to King Nebuchadnezzar. We ask you, Father, that you will empower the local church to be able to be holy because you have called us to be holy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, God, that you will have your way. We believe, God Almighty, that there's a devil, but we believe, God, that you are above him. And we believe that you are the kings of kings, God. We proclaim and declare that you are the Lord of lords, God. You are Yahweh. You are the prince of peace. You are Yeshua. God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, and you are everything in between, Jesus. You are Emmanuel. You are El Shaddai, God. And we believe that there is no limit to your power, and we believe, God Almighty, that there is no limit to the things that you can do. And this evening, God, we pray that your will will be done in the United States of America, from state to state, from city to city. And we pray that you will rise up the local church to be the answer, because you have called us to be the hands and feet while you are in heaven and we are on earth, God. In the name of Jesus, we walk by faith and not by sight, knowing that you are going to take us from glory to glory and in victory to victory. And in Jesus' name we pray and the church says, amen. the church says, amen. Amen, 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 and amen. Hey, how many of you guys have any pet peeves? A lot of, um, about, wow, about 95% of us have pet peeves. Okay, I like that we can have an honest conversation, church. I have a couple pet peeves, and there's, there's a few, there's, there's a group of people that have, a tr have trouble showing the love of Christ to. Y'all pray for me, because I'm, I'm still in a, in, a, in a learning process. I'm still trying to live and look and love like Jesus. But there's just a group of people, church, that I have a hard time just being patient with. And one of those group of people is people who are always running late. People who are always running late. You know we got somewhere to be at 8 p.m. And you text me you're on the way at 756 
p.m. And you know how we are, church. You know when we text, I'm on the way, we're really not on the way. And those kind of people, it is just whole hard for me to show the love of Christ to because you know we got somewhere to be and you are too grown to be doing this in your mid-30s. You know better. The other kind of people that I can't stand sometimes, I'm sorry, I mean, I mean the people that I have hard time showing the love of Christ to is people who just happen to always be rude. If we go out to dinner and we go out to eat and just for no reason you're mad because uh, your food is, is, is not coming out as fast as you want. You want to be mad at the bus, the bus boy. The bus boy didn't even take our order. Why are you mad at that bus boy? Or there's people also that when we get the bill, you want to act like you didn't order a Dr. Pepper and you want to put it on my top. It's only $2.55. And there's kind of people that it's hard to be patient with. You know what I'm talking about? You, you, you're thinking about that one cousin right now. You got that one cousin that it's just so hard to have patience for. But, all this, but on the other side of the spectrum, there's that one person that you just, that kind of person, that type of person that you just absolutely just love. The type of person that always seem to just show, uh, just, just, just get along with is people who are, no matter what, they're just always grateful. It doesn't matter what they're going through in life. They just always have a good perspective on the matter. They can get your, your drink all messed up in Starbucks. And the response is going to be, man, I'm just happy to have a cup of coffee this morning. I'm like, man, I, I like that perspective. Because there's people out there starving and we get the opportunity to be able to get whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want. I want to be like you when I grow up. There's the type of people that are just always grateful no matter what the situation may be, no matter what circumstance they may be in life. They always find a way to be grateful because of what they have in front of them. And those people and the type of people that remind me of some of who, who are grateful in the book of John chapter 12 is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in the book of John chapter 12 are grateful towards Jesus in this specific context. Now, if you're familiar with Jesus' story, if you're familiar with um, his journey, we know that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And on his way to Jerusalem, the Bible says that he stops at a small city called Bethany. Everybody say Bethany. He stops at Bethany because scholars believe that Bethany was like a, a, like a secondary home for Jesus. And every time he would go through to Bethany, some people suggest, some scholars and historians suggest that he always stayed with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. If he had any best friends, it was most likely Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He had a lot of love for this family. And as he's traveling to Jerusalem, he stops in Bethany. But we know, if we're familiar with his story, that this is not his first time in this small city. As a matter of fact, Jesus was just in Bethany the chapter before, in John chapter 11. While in chapter 12, they're excited that he's there. In John chapter 11, they're not so excited that he's there. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 11, Jesus is met with anger and avoidance because Mary and Martha invite Jesus over to make a miracle in their brother's life because he's dying and he delays on his arrival. So by the time he gets to John chapter 11, he's not welcomed with excitement. As a matter of fact, he's welcomed with anger and avoidance because Jesus did not move as fast as they wanted. Jesus did not show up when they expected him to show up. And isn't it true, church, that like Mary and Martha, we too can act this way. That when we don't see Jesus move as fast as we want him to, or when we don't see him show up the way we want him to, or the way we anticipated, we too want to meet Jesus Christ with anger and avoidance. Jesus Christ, in John chapter 11, is now welcomed with open arms. However, in John chapter 12, the next chapter, he is. He's welcomed with excitement. And the reason why he's welcome with excitement in John chapter 12 is because of what he did in a chapter before. And I want to remind us today, as we get ready to enter into a new chapter in this year, that we got to look back at, old, at the last year, at the old chapter, and when we can be able to remember and remind ourselves of what God did for us, I too think that we can be like Mary, 
Martha and Lazarus and show appreciation and gratitude in this chapter because of everything he did for us in the last chapter. Even if he didn't show up how you wanted, even if he didn't show up as fast as you wanted, ladies and gentlemen, we're still here. We still got air in our lungs. We still got shoes on our feet. We have money in our pockets. We got food on the table. And if we can remember our history with God, we can be able to see that he's been faithful to the very end. They look at this in this chapter, and we see that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are excited that Jesus has come to town. Jesus, he walks, he, he gets to Bethany, and he's met by Martha. The Bible says in verse, verse, verse 2, it says, so they gave him dinner for him there. Notice, notice how Martha shows her response of her appreciation toward Jesus. The Bible says that Martha served. That's it. Martha simply serves. That's how she starts to show her appreciation for Jesus. We know that in Luke chapter 10, we're, we're, we're told that Martha is a busybody. Martha, she has the gifting in hospitality. If anybody knew how to program and throw a party, it was Martha. If anybody knew how to get people together, it was Martha. Martha was so gifted in hospitality, church, that every time you went to her house and she would, she would vacuum, she, there was lines in the carpet because of her hospitality. That's impressive. That's impressive. She had a Kirby out there. And she had lines because she's gifted in hospitality. If anybody knew how to throw a party, it was Martha. Everybody went home with centerpieces. Why? Because it was Martha's party. Martha was gifted in hospitality. And the first point that I want to share with you this evening is if we're, going to be, if we're going to show a response to Jesus that we're grateful for him in this chapter because of what he did last chapter, then the first thing that we can do is be like Martha. And this is what Martha does. Martha serves with her talents. Jesus shows up to her house, and the first thing she does, the Bible says, as she starts to serve Jesus. Now, the word serve here that the Bible uses, in the Greek word, it is dia. Diakayo, diakayo, I probably butchered that, but the word means to serve from a place of gratitude. And I think that the church today needs more Marthas, where people can be able to serve from a place of gratitude. That we're not serving because we're told to, or we're not serving because we're forced to. But we're serving because in this chapter, we're so grateful for everything that God has done for me, for everything God has done for my family in the last chapter. What I love about Martha is that she saw a need and she filled it. Nobody needed to give her a paycheck. Nobody needed to call her. Nobody needed to send her a text. And I think the church today needs more Marthas where people see a need and they're willing to rise up and fill it. And people don't need to beg you. People don't need to be after you. You don't need a paycheck. But you are willing to serve from a place of gratitude because of everything God has done for you in the previous chapters of your life. I love that Martha is willing to serve from a place of gratitude. And people don't need to be behind her to ask her to serve. And I believe that if we're going to take Hope Chapel to another dimension, and I believe if we're going to take Hope Chapel to a new level, then we need more Marthas in our seats today. People who are willing to see a, to see a need and willing to fill it. And we don't need to be after you to ask you to serve. Martha serves with her talents. I hope that didn't offend you, church, because if you didn't like the first point, you're not going to like the second one. While Martha serves with her talent, notice what Mary does. Mary, the Bible says, in verse 2, it says, Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Mary, therefore, take a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 that, and given to the poor? And he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was used to be put in it. 
while Mary serves with her talents, this is what Mary does. While Martha serves with her talents, Mary, she sacrifices her treasures. Denari, I'm not entirely sure what denari means, but it sounds expensive. It's a lot of money. Some scholars even say that it was a full annual's wage that she was willing to give before the Lord. While Martha is serving with her talents, Mary sacrifices her treasure. A whole year's worth of wages. How much we make up in here? About 100000 over here? 150000 here in the middle? Another 250000 here? Can you imagine feeling so compelled that you want to give an annual wages to Jesus? Now, I'm not asking you to write a check. I'm not asking you to give money. But I do think that a way that we can respond to God in gratitude is by giving him the absolute best treasure that we have. Mary feels compelled enough to come before Jesus, break her alabaster jar, and anoint his feet with her best treasure. And I wonder what our church will look like. And I wonder what our services would feel like. And I wonder the type of chains that will be broken if you and I were able to come into these worship experiences and be able to offer Jesus the absolute best that you and I have. And instead of asking God to give him our best, instead we will come in a posture and give Jesus our best. I wonder what the city will look like. I wonder what our state will look like. If Christians like you and I didn't just come in on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings to fill in seats, but instead we went deeper with God and gave him the best worship, the best treasure that we can give by sacrificing ourselves and rendering our best treasure to Jesus Christ. I wonder how far he'll take our relationship with him. I wonder how far he'll take our marriages. I wonder how many kids we'll see surrendered to the feet of Jesus because you and I are willing to be compelled and give Jesus our absolute best treasure. And notice the Bible says that when she gets ready to give her best treasure, there is always going to be a voice of objection. When you give your best treasure and when you get ready to give your best worship, there's going to be somebody that says, why are your hands so up high in praise and worship? Why are you dancing all up in my pew? You know not to sit next to that person anymore. Because there's always going to be a voice of objection when you get ready to give your, your, get your best to Jesus. And you know who this person was? Isn't it sad that sometimes it's the own church that would try to criticize our best treasure? You know what I like about Mary? I like Mary because she's radical. Because Mary doesn't allow herself to be distracted by what the church has to say about her act of worship. Mary doesn't allow herself to be distracted by the murmuring of another disciple. Because you know what the truth is, church? Mary's not there for them. Mary's there for Jesus. And when you get ready to give your absolute best to Jesus, and someone always has something to say, because you always got that one cousin, don't allow yourself to be distracted. Because every time you get ready to give your best, there's always going to be a voice of objection. There's going to be something that goes in your head that says, Student loans. When you get ready to give your best treasure, there's going to be a voice that rises up and says, Turks and Caicos. There's going to be a voice, an objection. And you know what I think we need in our church today? We need more Marys. Mary people who are not willing to be distracted because they get, when they get ready to give their best worship to Jesus. I think the church needs more Marthas. I think our church needs more Marys. I want to drop this on you too, church, as I observed this, as I observed Martha Mary pouring her ointment on Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is there with his disciples. And wouldn't it be fair to say that the disciples should have the same posture Mary has in the place of worship, in the place of gratitude? 
and appreciation. But they're not. Because you know what happens, church? As we get so used to, to the things we used to be so in love with, that they're just now casually sitting at the table. And I wonder if that's happened to us as a community. I wonder if that's happened to us as individuals in our relationship with Jesus. That the reason why sometimes we can't offer our best treasure is because we've already gotten too used to the one we used to be so in love with. Because like Mary, we should have a posture of gratitude by willing to sacrifice our best treasure. If y'all don't like number two, y'all not going to like number three. I think we need more Marthas in our church today. And I want to let you know that whatever your title is outside of the church, I want to remind you and go on record and say that whatever your title is outside of the church, it actually benefits us inside of the church. Whatever your, your talent and strength is outside of the church, it actually straightens us inside the local church. Because we need more Marthas who are willing to share and serve with their talents. And then we need more Marys who are willing to sacrifice their best treasure. We need more Marthas and we need more Marys. Look at your neighbor and say, we need you to be more like Martha and we need you to be more like Mary. Even if your name is Martha or Mary. I really like what Lazarus is doing, though. I'm going to invite the team to come back up as we get ready to finish with a song. But I want us to observe Lazarus' position. Why Martha is serving with her talents and why Mary is sacrificing her treasure. Notice that Lazarus, he's just at the table. He's not running around like his sister, nor is he in a deep place and posture like Mary. You know what uh, Lazarus is doing? Lazarus is just... He's just in awe of Jesus. You guys seen that gif? With the guy who's... Uh, What's that guy's name who played Blackhawk or Hawkeye? He's just like, he's just in awe. And I love that about Lazarus. He's just reclining at the table. While Martha is serving with her talents and Mary is sacrificing her treasure, Lazarus is surrendering his time. And you know why he's surrendering his time? We read in the very first verse when we started. Verse 1 said, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had just raised from the dead. And the reason why Lazarus is able to be at the table in awe of Jesus is because he knows in the previous chapter, Jesus just raised him from the dead. As a matter of fact, he wouldn't be in chapter 12 if God's hand wasn't in and over his life in chapter 11. And there's some of us that have to testify that the only reason why we made it to a new chapter in 2022 is because God's hand and God's favor was in our life and over our life in a chapter before this one. And I think the reason why sometimes we can't spend time with Jesus like Lazarus does is not even because of sin. It's because of busyness, because of the society and this culture that we live in. You're not even in sin that's keeping you from spending time with Jesus. It's just busyness. So if we're going to give a reciprocal response to Jesus into this new year, and as we get ready to journey into a new year, I think we need more Marthas in our churches today. I think we need more Marys in our churches today. And the best way we can show a response to Jesus is by surrendering our time. Because you and I both have to agree that our biggest commodity in our life is our time. How can we tell Jesus we love him if we never spend time with him? 
How can we come into a place of worship and do the mechanical Christianese stuff? We know the vocabulary. We throw our hands to praise and worship. We sing songs that are displayed on the screen for us. We memorize them, but we never spend time with God outside of Wednesdays and Sunday mornings. We need more Marthas in our churches today that are willing to rise up, see a need, and fill it and serve with their talents. We need more Marys who are willing to sacrifice their best treasure. And whatever your best is, only you and God knows, and God will accept that and take you to another dimension. Not just take you, but your marriage and your future generations and our whole community. Not just that, but our city, our state, and our nation. Because the local church, there's men and women who finally got serious about their relationship with God and are willing to surrender their best treasure to the feet of Jesus and people who can be like Lazarus and surrender their time because we recognize that his faithfulness is what carried us over. We recognize that in his hand, his hand, if his hand wasn't in my life in the previous chapter or previous chapters, I would have never made it to this one. And if we're going to give God a response into this new year, then I pray and I believe that the best thing we can do, like Lazarus, is to surrender our time. Has he been faithful to you? If he's been faithful to you, won't, if you're physically able, won't you stand to your feet? As I get it ready, I want to show my heart with you, share my heart with you. And as a pastor of this community, my prayer is that when we look into the community, we will see Mar Mary, Martha's and more Lazarus. That this year for our community will be something completely different than we've ever experienced because we've developed characteristics like Martha. Because God's been faithful to us so we can be like Mary and we can respond like Lazarus because he's been faithful to us.